So, good evening, everyone. Let us uh, start the uh, second part of our meeting tonight. As always, with a prayer, we ask the spiritual benefactors that look after us in our families, at our workplace, our cities, our states, our countries, this planet, for all of them, to continue to bless us with strength and courage so we may face all the adversities, all the difficulties of our lives and progress both intellectually and morally towards them, using them as our guides, using them as the most immediate examples we have, but always having our master, Jesus Christ, in the back of our minds. May we not only do so, but may also, uh, may it also be possible for us to implement everything that we learn in our daily lives so that we may, we may also enlighten others. And with, in doing so, bring to them the light that we collect from our benefactors here. It is our, with our hearts filled with great emotion, and great gratitude, that we thank you all for everything we have received. Now we ask your permission to start our second part of the studies tonight. So again, good evening, everyone. Uh, remember, we are studying the um, heaven and hell. And last week, Elmo uh, told us about uh, the person that um, was buried alive. And we discussed at length uh, the whole point of that. We saw uh, his communication a few, uh, a few days after his death. And we also saw the comments of uh, the spirit Erastus. So today we're just going to finish this by looking at the commentaries from Alan Kardec, which is, um, João, do you have the page? Uh, well, it's been, it's been shown on your screen, so I can just follow from there. Okay. And Soraida, would you uh, read it for us? You hear me? Okay, you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, Go okay. Ahead, okay, you start at what? Uh, the, the paragraph? Right, on, uh, right under Erastus. Right, right. Okay, good. 520. Okay. Doesn't this example contain a great and awesome teaching? Thus, God's justice always reaches the guilty. And although it may arrive late sometimes, it does not fail to follow its cause nonetheless. Isn't it eminently moral to realize that if great, greatly guilty individuals live their existence peacefully and often in abundance of earthly assets, their hour of expiation will nevertheless sound sooner or later? Punishments of this nature are understandable, not only because we can witness them somehow, but also because they are logical. We believe in them because of our reason accepts them. Thus, an honorable existence does not exclude the trials of life, since one has chosen or accepted them as a supplement to expiation. It is a remaining balance on a debt that we may pay before we receive the reward for the progress we have accomplished. If we consider how frequent acts of barbarity were in days gone by, but which shock us so much nowadays, even among the highest and most enlightened classes, how many murderers were committed in those times when the lives of others were disregarded and when the weak were unscrupulously crushed by the powerful? Then one will understand that among our contemporaries, there must be those who have cleansed their past. One will no longer wonder at the considerable number of persons who succumb as victims of isolated accidents or general catastrophes. The despotism and fanaticism 
ignorance and prejudice of the Middle Ages and of the times that followed bequeathed to future generations an immense death, death that has not yet been liquidated. Many examples of misfortune seem to us to be undeserved solely because we can only see the present. Thank you. Okay. All right. So there's very little that we can add because uh, last week Elmo did a very good job. You know, when he was explaining to us, we saw what happened to Antonio B, um, uh, that he was buried alive and that later on he confessed that he had been um, a somewhat very, a somewhat nasty individual. And that was a part of the, uh, the consequences that he had created for himself. So Erastus also elaborated on it in terms of the cause and consequence. When we read this passage, we always have to, actually the whole book, we have to be very careful with words such as punishment, words such as, uh, that, that gives a, a, a tone of uh, finality to things. We have to understand it as a, uh, as a means of cause and consequence. All the actions of this human being in past reincarnation processes, Mr. Antonio B, led him to operate in such a manner to actually look for his own redemption, for his own education through certain difficulties, which for others on the outside may look very drastic, right? But what is important is that he went through it as a as a, a, a means to recover from things to redeem himself from things that he did in the past so god's justice is everywhere god's justice does not apply any pen, uh, penalization to a crime god's justice only states that whatever we do whatever we say whatever we think we set, in, we set to motion consequences. So the consequences are nothing more than the result of our own actions, speech, and thoughts. And that we, we will undergo them one point or another. This last part that we just read, and I'm not gonna elaborate too much on it because when we study the next case, little, we are going to see many things that I'm gonna rehash a lot of what I'm saying right now. But what this passage is telling us is that sometimes we observe someone and we think that that individual has a perfect life. And all of a sudden, like Mr. Antonio B, he had the means, he had a happy life, he had a happy family. But eventually, it, he goes at the very, very end of his reincarnation process through a terrible ordeal, which was to wake up in his coffin and probably survive for another two to three hours at most. Okay, I did some calculations after last week's uh, conversation. Uh, taking the average size of a coffin, we, are, we have about five and a half hours of air to breathe. So, but it actually ends up being less than that because what happens is that as we start panicking, we will actually consume oxygen even faster. So, and, and eventually, you don't have to consume all the oxygen from the coffin. Once the oxygen level drops below a certain level, we actually go into a, a, a sleep state and eventually into a comatose state before we get into death. So we will only be conscious for about maybe an hour and a half to two hours at most. But it doesn't matter. Imagine those two hours. It must have been excruciating. So... He went through that, not because God willed it, God wanted to punish him, or because God's justice wanted to punish him. God loves all his children, all of us, without discrimination, without any special treatment. We are the ones who end up creating these difficulties for ourselves because of our actions, our thoughts, and our speech from past lives and sometimes even this life itself. This is very important for us to understand here. And that these consequences in, in a way are 
part of our doing and because it's part of our doing, the only way we can move on in terms of our moral and intellectual progress is if we face them. Without facing them, we are somewhat stuck. We may not face them right now, we may not face it tomorrow, but we will eventually face them, whether today, tomorrow, or in another reincarnation from now, or even two or three reincarnations from now. So this is what is important. It is, it, we may see as an excruciating um, trial uh, to, to us, but he came out of it a winner because he went through it and he did not blame the divinity. He did not blame the creator for it. He understood and he tells us that, and it asks us later on comments on it. He tells us that he understood the implications of his past actions that led him to that particular type of death. Hmm. Okay. okay. It seems all very much in line with the things we just studied, free will and, you know, the fatalism and knowing the future. It, I don't know. It, it just, it seems all very much in line with that. It's like an example of what we just studied. Yes. Actually, heaven and hell, I always, I always say that heaven and hell is very much in line with, uh, with some of the, like when we look at the, the, the books of the codification, we can actually pair up certain, uh, certain things. We can pair up, for instance, Spirit's book with the gospel according to spiritism. The Spirit's book is the technical manual. The gospel according to spiritism is the user's manual, the practice manual. And we can also pair up the medium's book with heaven and hell. The medium's book is the technical manual. And then you apply everything when you read heaven and hell because you see the cases from the spirits themselves. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. So, Raida, let's talk okay. about Leto. Leto. Okay. Mr. Leto, a manufacturer who lived on the outskirts of Paris, died a horrible death in April of 1864. A vat of boiling varnish caught fire, and in the blink of an eye, his body was covered with flaming matter. He knew right away that he was lost along with a young apprentice in the shop at the time, he had enough strength to reach his home more than 200 yards away. By the time he could be given first aid, shreds of his charred flesh were falling off, and the bones on part of his body and face were exposed. He survived for 12 hours in excruciating suffering. Despite it all, he kept his presence of mind up to the last moment and put his affairs in order with perfect lucidity. Throughout the cruel agony, no one heard utter, no one heard him utter one single groan, one single murmur. He died praying to God. He was a most horrible, he was a most horrible man of a gentle and benevolent character, loved and cherished by all who knew him. He had enthusiastically embraced spiritist ideas, though without much reflection. For this reason, and being somewhat of a medium himself, he was a target of several deceptions, and nevertheless, his faith did not weaken as a result. In certain cases, his trust in what spirit said to him verged on naivete. Upon being evoked at Parisian Society on April 29, 1864, a few days after his death, and still under the influence of the terrible scene of which he had been victim, he provided the following communication. Thank you, Sarah. Let's okay. make a pause here. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm not going to talk much about it. We all got an idea of how he died. Mm -hmm. He had very, very bad burns, probably second to third degree burns. All right. So there's not much we can say about that. But there is one point there that is quite interesting. And I defy everyone here to find a place, a spiritual center or a, a a meeting of spiritists or spiritists to be 
where someone will, ne will not ask or will never ask the question, why did he have to suffer? He was such a nice person. He or she, in this case, it's he. Okay, it doesn't matter if it's a he or she, but in this case, we are seeing Mr. Leto's story, right? It says even at the very end of this paragraph, he had been a nice individual, he was a spiritist. Remember, he passed away in 1864. So that is, spiritism is already now available, was available to, to, to most people there, in, at, at least, uh, especially in France, right? So while uh, we are talking about someone who had already some ideas, he was a medium himself. He was an, an honest individual, an honorable man, benevolent character. And then we ask, why is that? And it's in, it's in us, in all of us. Oh, he, she was such a good person. Why did it happen? Why did he, she had to go through such a horrible uh, ordeal or, or even a, in this case, a horrible death? So let us keep this in mind because we always ask our que this question. We always do. Even if we don't voice it, we think about it. So let us see what uh, Mr. Lettle has to say when he was actually invoked at a spiritist meeting and um, came and answered some of our questions because this will apply to every one of us. Okay. So Soraida, you can continue. We can, can I ask a question? Uh, sure. Julio. Yeah. Julio. So I, I'm not sure I completely understood when they said um, um, being somewhat of a medium himself, he was the target of several deceptions. I, I don't know what, I don't know. Maybe I, I just don't really follow what they're pointing out. We, uh, well, yeah, there, there are a few things there in the translation that are, are not actually correct and it changes the story a little bit. It, this is one of them. Um, the other one is when they say that uh, he, um, he went to his home. Actually, they even say, even being far away in the original, he managed to get to his home. Okay. So, but this, to get to your question, um, it, in the original, what they want to convey, you have to remember, this is the beginning of spiritism. All right. Mm -hmm. Very beginning. Okay. So, they wanted to convey the, the impression that he was attempting to, uh, to study, to work with it, to educate himself. And in doing so, and that's the being somewhat of a medium himself, himself. We don't have much more information than how many meetings he, uh, he uh, um, attended, things like that. We don't. But what they want to convey there probably is the fact that being up someone was trying to educate himself, he was opening himself to the influence and being aware of that influence. But we cannot say much more than that because mm. we don't have much more from the original. So, so deception is probably not the right word. Um, no, it, it is the, it, it is uh, in, the, in the original. The word is deception. So they probably mm. were trying to think about um, ignorant spirits, even malevolent spirits, they do use the, the, the word. So uh, okay. we should not read too much. We'll see when we talk about, talk, uh, and, uh, about what he has to say. The idea here is that perhaps because they are situating him as a, 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 a young spiritist, because they were all young spiritists at the time, young in the sense of, um, new to the doctrine because the doctrine itself was new perhaps what they wanted to convey there is that even being a spiritist does not prevent you from having a situation like this that you're not going to be excused or get special treatment for that mm -hmm. okay okay thank you okay oh you're welcome okay we'll continue then Upon being evoked at the Parisian Society on April 29, 1864, a few days after his death, and still under the influence of the terrible sense of which he had been the victim, he provided the following communication. Profound sadness oppresses me. I am so aghast at my tragic death, and I feel like I am under the executioner's axe. How I suffered. Oh, how I suffered. I'm trembling all over. It seems like I can still smell the fetid odor 
that burned flesh cast around me. An agony of 12 hours that you, O guilty spirit, endured. It has suffered without complaining, and so God will give it his forgiveness. Oh, my dear wife, do not cry over me any longer. My pain will soon abate. I am no longer suffering physically, but the remembrance is the same as the reality. My knowledge of spiritism is helping me a great deal, and I can now see that without such a sweet belief, I would have remained in the delirium into which I was cast by that horrible death. However, I have a consoling spirit who hasn't left me since I breathed my last. I was still able to speak when I saw him already at my side. I thought that a reflection of my pain was making me delirious and causing me to see ghosts. But no, it was my guardian angel who silently and quietly consoled my heart. As soon as I left the earth behind, he said, Come, my son, greet the new day. Then I breathed more easily, believing I had left a horrifying nightmare. I talked about my beloved wife, that courage child who had devoted herself to me. He said, they are all on the earth, whereas you, my son, are with us. I went looking for my house, my angel, let me re-enter it in his company. I saw everyone bathe in tears, sadness and mourning had invaded that once peaceful dwelling. I couldn't handle the scene of such a painful spectacle any longer, and all emotional, I said to my guide, Oh, my good angel, let's get out of here. Yes, let's leave, he responded, and seek repose. Since then, I have suffered less. And if I didn't see my wife so inconsolable and my friend so sad, I would be almost happy. Thank my you. good guy, my... Okay. Okay, sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I just want to break here because yeah. you see in his narrative... You see now when he's telling uh, the, the 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 members of the um, of the seance of the uh, mediumistic meeting that he has he shows a lot of forbearance he shows strength he shows courage he tells that he suffered and in the very first paragraph when he starts profound sadness oppresses me be careful there because he refers to him almost as if he the spirit is different from he the body yep. so this is why it says there sometimes he speaks of himself in the third person but the idea it, it is trying to convey to us is he suffered but in some way there was in him some serenity despite the horrible suffering and for those of of, of us who have uh, exper uh, experienced the uh, you know uh, having large parts of our bodies burned, it's really excruciating, and the smell of the burnt flesh is horrible and stays in your nose for days. Okay? Um, despite despite uh, all of that, he has some serenity, and he's trying to console his wife. Uh, he's trying to say to her not to cry over him, about him any longer. So this... There, is a, there are a few things we should talk about there. That number one is this serenity, is this forbearance, this understanding of what happened to him. And then the part where he's telling the ones that remained here in the physical realm not to be so sad, not to, to cry so much, because we are in con constant contact with them, you know, with the, the spiritual realm. And this is the part where it says in the paragraph, however, I have a consoling spirit. Notice that when he visited his home, his previous home now, and he saw those who were left behind here in the physical realm, that their sadness actually affected them, affected him tremendously. So it's not that he's saying, don't be sad that I'm gone. It's not that but in the way that they were conducting themselves was actually impacting him tremendously. We have some books by Andre Luis where we, we, we study this and see how much the, um, the spirits who depart are affected by those who are left behind in the sense of how, how they go about their sadness, how they express their sadness. And in this particular case, his friends and his family members were so bereft 
that it was making him sick. So we have to think about this for ourselves because we all lose at one point or another in our lives, good friends, loved ones, and how we go about that sadness impact them, impacts them tremendously, significantly. And there's a last point that I want to make is that notice that he speaks of a guardian angel or let's call it a, a guardian spirit nowadays. It doesn't really matter if you say angel or, or spirit. The point is someone who was assisting him throughout this process. And we are going to come back to this angel, this guardian spirit, mm -hmm. and back to Teresa's question, because it's kind of interesting. He is not the only one who is being assisted. We all have someone who is all constantly guiding us, assisting us. But this individual, Lentil, Mr. Lentil, shows some understanding of the situation and it's not necessarily an understanding through spiritism, but an understanding it from the point of view of allowing that individual, that spirit, that consoling spirit, as he calls it, to approach him. He listens to that consoling spirit. And because of that, he doesn't place any barriers to that assistance. All of us have assistance. The question we have to ask ourselves is if we are willing to accept it. Most of the times, our, it's not our, our ignorance, but it's our pride, our arrogance that pushes them away, that creates barriers for them to assist us. But they are there for us, mm -hmm. as they were there for Mr. Leto. Leto, sorry. Um, yes, Julie. Yes, Louisa. Before we go any further, I find it so, so, uh, so. I mean, give us hope, right? Because he says that his um, knowledge. Did we change pages by any chance? I think we did, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, then we did that he says that his knowledge, my knowledge of spirit is, is helping me a great deal. And I can now see that without such a sweet belief, I would have remained in the delirium into which I was cast by the horrible death. So, um, you know, what a relief and, and how important it is for all of us that are participating here how, how, I mean, all the good that we get from all the studies that we do, and it, it, those studies doesn't, don't help us only now, but in the future life, so it's quite a relief. It's a pity that Renato is not here today, so he will see hope, <laughs> you know what I mean? He's always... <laughs> saying things about uh, yeah so i just wanted to point that out it's quite uh, it's a relief to leave yes me. no very good point uh the knowledge that we acquire here when we accept this knowledge when uh -huh. we think because and when we think about this knowledge because remember it's not blind faith but rational faith it's not coming here and basically swallowing everything that we hear. No, but we think about it and we implement this knowledge. We implement this knowledge in ourselves. Okay, Jean, do you have a question? Oh. So we implement this knowledge in, in us. And of course, this brings us this, what he says here, sweet relief. I, I think too, I think somewhat, um, this is Teresa, that it's, he, he's somewhat of an elevated spirit because just by the idea that, you know, he actually tells the angel, come on, let's get out of here. Because when you read in some of the other books, they have a hard time, you know, convincing people to, you know, um, 
be careful there and that it's going to be hard to see your family and and people you know you, you read in some of the other books how people get stuck or they have a really hard time experiencing that of and also detaching from it because Good they, point, they, they yeah is actually somewhat um knowledgeable spirit i would say and for one reason we hear we read sorry we read quite a lot in Andrea Luis's books where spirits want to come back and visit their parents and they are said they are actually told not now you're not ready and he came so he had he probably had enough in himself he probably had incorporated enough in himself of all the teachings that he managed to to learn and remember this is very young spiritism so he probably incorporated quite a lot of those teachings uh, to be given this opportunity to visit the family so quickly so he had in him it, it, it's not a question of um uh oh, he did this and that good action. So no, the merit here is in terms of he had enough understanding of his situation not to make a scene for himself, yeah. a scene in the sense of suffering even more. What he suffered was to see the family in, um, in great sadness, but not that, for instance, he, he, let's say, he tied himself to a chair and he would not like to go back uh, to the spiritual realm, you know, some sort of a tantrum. It's not that. So he had enough understanding of his situation to be warranted this opportunity, to be granted this opportunity. Exactly. Okay. Okay. My good guide, my dear angel, Told me why I had experienced such a terrible death. And for your instruction, my children, I want to confess something to you. Two centuries ago, I ordered a young girl, as innocent as one could be at that age, about 12 to 14 years, to be buried at the stake. What was she accused of? Alas, for having been the accomplice of a conspiracy against the police of the clergy. At the time, I was an Italian judge of the Inquisition. And since the executors didn't dare touch the, bo the body of the poor child, I myself was both judge and executor. Oh, justice, God's justice, how great you are. I have yielded to you. I have promised so much not to waver on the day of struggle that I had the strength to keep my commitment. I did not complain, and you have, given, and you have forgiven me. Oh, my God. But when will the remembrance of my poor innocent victim be erased from my memory? Is it this which causes me to suffer? She must forgive me too. Oh, you children of the new doctrine, you sometimes say we cannot remember what we did previously, and that is why we cannot avoid the evils to which we expose ourselves. It is due to our forgetfulness of the past. Oh, my brothers, praise to God. Praise God for his he were to allow you to have such remembrance, there would be no respite for you while on earth. Constantly assailed by shame and remorse, could you enjoy a moment of peace? Forgetfulness is a blessing. Remembrance here is a torture. In just a few more days, and as recompense for the resignation with which I bore my suffering, God shall grant me the forgetfulness of my wrong. That is what my good angel has just promised me. Thank you. Okay. I wish we could all start, you know, reading the, the books of the codification by certain pieces, by certain parts, certain excerpts. And this is one of them when it comes to heaven and hell. Look at what he did. Two centuries before his uh, last reincarnation, the one that he's telling us here, he had been a judge, okay, in terms of a religious inquisition. And uh, he ordered a young, a child, basically a, a preteen to be burned at the stake. And because people were probably um, most likely shocked since it was a young girl, uh, nobody wanted to do it, so he did it. So he was not just a judge, he was the, also the one that condemned 
that the individual that set fire to the, to the pyre, to the stake. And what is important for us to see here is that God did not will him to die by this horrible death of being, you know, almost burnt alive. It's not that. It was his actions in a past life that led him to be so horrified himself with his actions that he prepared himself to such a way in order for him not to ask her forgiveness, the girl's forgiveness, as we are going to see later on, but to re rid himself of the guilt that he felt. So here we see a spirit that is not only showing forbearance for what he went through, it's not only showing forbearance for such an excruciating form of death, but you see someone who worked in these two centuries between ordering the girl to, to, to die at the stake, and now when he himself felt the same horrifying type of death, you see a spirit that had been working and probably very hard to overcome the things that he had done, and most importantly, his guilt. The guilt of an action that he promoted, that he did, nobody else. No, oh, I was ordered, my reincarnation process told me to do that, it was in the plan, no. That he, from past lives, from a past, specific past life, had set to motion by his own actions. And look at this paragraph, all you children of the Neil Doctrine. This is beautiful because he makes, an, he appeals to us. He beseeches us to realize that we are, we are the ones governing our own destinies. We, he's saying to us, do not accuse God of this or that because you don't remember what you did in the past because knowing it would have been, would be even worse for us. Remember that he only realized why he suffered the way he suffered after he went back to the spiritual realm and because he probably had evolved, he had progressed enough that his guardian angel could actually break the nails to him. If he had not progressed to this level that we see here by his own narrative, his guardian angel would not have told him because it might have led him to a state of anger, of agitation, of blasphemy. But he had evolved morally, particularly in this case, so much in these 200 years between his horrible crime and his now horrible death that he was ready to accept the truth, understanding it and, not, and using it to move on and to progress even further. And then he tells us, do not waste your time trying to, trying to blame you know, God, the creator, for not knowing what you have done in the past. We always say, oh, if I knew it, I would know how to, what to do now. We wouldn't, we would probably feel even guiltier than we feel already intuitively or we would feel very angry because we would say no now i have a reincarnation process where i have to do this no one has to do anything we are here because we have decided on this because we have things that are in our minds they're all the way buried in that part of in our essence for which we feel guilt, about which we feel guilt, and we want to move on from that point. So we come to this world, we come to the physicality to learn and to actually see if we can move beyond that point. It's our journey here, we have decided upon this journey in some way or another. So now to ask God to reveal things from our past, 
would only put us in jeopardy or our you know reincarnation process in jeopardy all the work that we are trying to do no matter how small we think we do we are doing it doesn't matter it's our work it's our progress it's important to us if we were to know our past our relationships with those that are around us perhaps we would not be able actually not perhaps we would not be able to hold, to to handle it well and it would most likely jeopardize our reincarnation process at best we would not be able to handle it and we would get stuck and we would be missing this opportunity in the physicality to move on and he says that then at the end forgetfulness this temporary forgetfulness is a blessing is a forgetfulness in the physicality because he says even further remembrance here is a torture now that he knows about it he can go he he can start the healing process of himself with respect to his guilt and he can now probably find ways of addressing this uh, girl this other spirit uh, and perhaps come to terms with the whole process um, so, Julio, would it be fair to say that um, resignation is needed for overcoming guilt or in dealing with guilt? It's a part of the process, yes, yes. Okay. So, well, this is a really good sell then because, like, to resign and then he's, he's going to, you know, totally be granted the forgetfulness of that entire wrong. that that that's i don't know i feel like that that's that's encouraging i it's like i think it's it's it, it's motivating um right i mean is that what i'm understanding that that he'll totally lose that memory of ever having done that well we all we all have this somewhat forgetfulness this veil of forgetfulness as we normally say when we reincarnate all right but he has brought he has he brought his forbearance to such a level that back in the spirituality he was then granted the opportunity of knowing of remembering even his past there because when we go back to the spiritual realm we don't necessarily remember everything from past reincarnations mm. Okay. okay, so he, he has achieved by his own work, morally and intellectually, okay, he's achieved morally and intellectually in his own way, an, a, a situation where he was ready to face that, so he could bring that from his unconscious mind all the way to his conscious mind, part of his mind, and be able to deal with it. Because yeah, he, had, I, he had developed himself enough to then face it. Most of us, we even go back to the spiritual realm, when if we still have a, a lot of anger in us or blasphemy or some form of manifestation that is negative to ourselves, that is destructive, we will not just, just because we go back and become spirits, we, we lose the physicality, we don't actually, um, in, the, uh, in the spiritual realm, we don't get to know everything. It's sometimes veiled from us still un, un, for another reincarnation, even another one, until we are ready to deal with it. Because the, this is what I say, God's justice wants us to be happy, to progress towards the divine. So revealing it right away, when we are not ready, it's not going to be productive for us. It's just not going to. But we need to understand one interesting thing here. It's not that when we say revealing, it's kind of a bad word, but we really don't have another one. Because when we say revealing, it feels like it's an external source that blocks it or not. It is not. We are the ones who block it. We, are, we, we get to a point where we feel guilt or, or horror or terror, or we just don't care about it, that we block it. It's, it's in us. 
this veil of forgetfulness that we so uh, uh, allegorically say, is, state is not something that um, it's not like a, a, a blanket that is put on our heads or no it's actually something we do we suppress and repress that until we feel that we are ready to 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 go back to it and address it it's in us in us mm -hmm. so when we speak of um um forget forgetfulness being a, a blessing remembrance a torch and this and that it gives the idea that it's something external to us that is preventing us from remembering and eventually releases that information to us. No, we are the ones doing that. He, by his own efforts, matured morally and intellectually to such a level that he could say to himself, I'm ready to look at this and, and remove that, that repressed or remove, take that information back from the repressed state and bring it to his conscious mind and say, now I'm going to deal with it. Okay. This so, whole idea of the angel talking and this and that, the angel is just there helping him. He has reached the point of doing that. Okay. So this part where it says, God shall grant me the forgetfulness of my wrong, you're saying it's it's not anything from god it's of his own self yes we have to understand when this was written okay we are moving from christi from christianity from christian ideas so the 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 language is still very um it's very uh it's laden with certain uh, phrases that, we, that comes from Christianity, and that even for you know, modern day Christians, we would not say that anymore. We would say, no, I am the one um, taking control of my life. God assists me in encouraging me. God assists me in uh, giving me strength, right? So all of this is an old language that we have to preserve in the translation, much like we preserve Shakespeare's original English. But then we can have on a set on another page the interpretation to modern English. Here we have to interpret these things in the light of our rational faith. We cannot expect God to be directing what we do because then there is determinism to such an, a point that we have no, neither the merit for our successes nor the responsibility for our failures. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Mr. Lentil's character during his last incarnation demonstrates how much his spirit had improved itself. His conduct was the result of his repentance and the good resolutions he had made beforehand, but that was not sufficient. He had to crown his resolutions with a great act of expiation. He had to bear as a man the torture that he had inflicted on another. In such a terrible circumstance, resignation was for him the greatest trial. Unfortunately, he did not fail it. His understanding of spiritism undoubtedly contributed greatly to sustaining his courage due to the sincere faith that it had given, given him in the future. He knew that life's sufferings were trials and expiations, and he had resignedly submitted to them by saying, God is just. I have therefore deserved them. Okay. So here, same thing. When we say God is just, I have therefore deserved them. This deserve almost gives us the feeling that, oh, it's coming from God, this type of punishment, this type of difficulty. No, it did not. God simply allowed him to progress in his own terms. It took 200 years for him to do it. If it had, been, if it had to be a punishment, why not earlier? Why not earlier? Why do we have to wait 200 years? He had to wait 200 years to, to get rid of that guilt that he was feeling, to begin to atone for something that he did. That to me does not sound just at all, but that is because we want immediate justice or perhaps we want immediate retaliation that we color, we color and we disguise it as justice. No, 
God allows us in the perfect justice, divine justice allows us to take our time to understand what we did, the, consequence, the consequences we created, and then find ways to address the problem on our own. Because then when we do that, as Mr. Little did, we, showing this resignation, this forbearance, showing this understanding, we then can crown ourselves with the success of the action because we started this action in the same way that he started the destructive action of sending someone to be to, to death at a stake, at the stake, to be burned at the stake. He started that action. Why shouldn't he be given the opportunity? Why shouldn't he be allowed the opportunity actually to start the action of his own redemption, of his own understanding, of his own success story. So in the same way that he started something horrible 200 years before his re last reincarnation, and it happened, there was no intervention, divine or otherwise. He, he as a judge decided on it. He as a judge even executed it, and that was it. No one stopped him, you know, as a higher, you know, less as a high order spirit or even the divine himself, the creator himself. But then once he set that to motion, he created the consequences for himself. And now he is allowed an opportunity to address it in his own terms, in his own way, and is showing us a success story. So, Julio, it's Teresa again. Mm -hmm. Back in the uh, previous section we just read, at the bottom of the, um, on 524, at the bottom of the first uh, paragraph there, he says, she must forgive me too. So I'm thinking that is hooked in with his guilt uh, because it's not like he, well, anyway, I just, why, why, what's the importance of make, making that statement? Because it's a, it's a two-part process or, 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 or situation, okay? He caused an immense amount of harm to another individual, to another spirit. So the problem that he created for himself, the consequences of that action can be split in two large groups. One is what he feels about it himself. It is the guilt that he felt until now that made him he repress that memory. Like I said, until now. But then there is the other part when you have to address the one that you have insulted, that you have injured, that you have ruined because if it would be very easy if i could just say oh okay so now i'm just gonna set myself on fire let's say because i did that to someone but what does that do to the individual that you actually injured you have to address that think of someone for instance that in a meeting at the office for instance says something bad to you if that person says something bad to you, disrespects you in front of everybody else, when that person actually asks uh, to be excused and say, I'm sorry I did that, that individual has to do the same thing in front of everybody. Because otherwise, it would be very easy. I would insult everyone in public, and then I would just, in private, say to them, oh, I'm sorry. How much is that sorry worth in that yeah. sense? So we have to be very careful. Divine justice has to cover every contingency, every aspect of it. So he has addressed the first one, the guilt, because without addressing that guilt, there is no way that he can sincerely work with the, the, that other spirit and ask for forgiveness. It's not only the fact that the spirit might not give the forgiveness, it's the fact that if he's feeling very, if he's feeling guilt, that if he's feeling the guilt of the act, 
even if that other spirit gives him, you know, the forgiveness, uh, forgives him for that, he won't be able to understand it because his heart is occupied by this guilt that is a massive emotion that does not let anything else in. By beginning to address the guilt, by beginning to dismantle, disassemble that psychological state, he frees his mind to the acceptance of her forgiveness. Whether she's going, you know, that that other spirit is going to forgive him or not is a different story. That's on her. That's a different story. But without him addressing the guilt first, he cannot accept forgiveness from somebody else, even when that somebody else is willing to give it to him. And also, just say he didn't deal with the guilt and say, then she there's room for her to like to become an obsessor spirit of his like say if she doesn't want to for, you know that kind of gives that uh makes a possibility for the handshake well there are many possibilities true yes yeah. um for instance she can forgive him and at this point they can actually start a journey that's the best scenario possible then they can both start a journey together one assisting the other but with not assisting because they owe one another something, but because they have created a bond that is now a bond of love as opposed to a bond of hatred. And there's the opposite situation where she may not forgive him and as a, that spirit may start be, uh, obsessing him. Becomes, that spirit will become an obsessor to him. But then we have to remember that obsession process is a, a handshake. So that other spirit may try to make things difficult for him, may try to influence him in a negative way, but he will only be truly obsessed if he actually shake hands with that particular type of energy, that particular type of thought, that particular type of behavior from that spirit. What we see from him, from this very short narrative, encourages us to believe, I cannot say for sure, but encourages us to believe that he is above this point. That even if it's not perfect, he has already enough understanding of the perils of addressing a handshake with a, a negative connotation, a negative behavior. So perhaps even if that other spirit decides to obsess him, it will not be a very successful obsession process. Yeah, because I'm thinking overcoming or, you know, um, I don't, whatever is the word, just the guilt, that's huge because guilt is such a huge opening for uh, obsessor spirits or, you know. Very good point. Exactly. Very good point. This is why, for instance, um, if uh, if he had just asked her for forgiveness, it would might it, it would not have worked. It had asked her for forgiveness because if he was still feeling the guilt, she could actually be saying she could actually be giving a forgiveness that was not true, was not sincere, and um, you know behind his back trying to uh, obsess him and feeling the guilt. He would have been very easily a uh, very easy prey to that obsessive uh, process. So we, have, we always have to start with ourselves. We have to forgive ourselves for the action that we had before we can actually ask forgiveness to those we have injured, that we have ruined, that we have somehow um, offended. Thank you. It's the famous shadow in us. The shadow in us prevents us from being constructive and from accepting a constructive thought or 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 action towards us or a, a nice word towards us what once we have this shadow hanging up uh, over us we it's almost like a barrier an energetic barrier a spiritual barrier to anything that is constructive the forgiveness be, begins in us from us from within and outwardly then. Once we finish the process in us, 
we can go and seek the forgiveness of those we have somewhat offended or, or, or ruined in some way or another. Julio, there is a question on the chat. Um, okay. Uh, so the question is, do we have a chance to change our path as soon as we understand the purpose in life? Is that the one? Yes. I hope so. Okay. Yes, of course we do. Um, if, we, if we didn't, there would be no point because then we would have come, we would be coming here and we'd be an automaton. We would have to follow a particular um, predetermined uh, path or even plan in this case, because this would be the plan. Right. Even if that plan was something that I did. Uh, so we are always in, we are always developing our free will and we are always in full control of our free will, our free will, not other things, our free will. And in, in doing so, we can put that free will to operate with our intelligence and change things for ourselves he could have come he could have come he could have had that nice life that he had and not uh, done anything at the very end and he would still have that consequence to deal with conversely if we come to this life and eventually circumstances assist us in such a way because we are in society so we also feel the uh, the uh, the environment around us we may find circumstances that will give us strength and courage to do even a little bit more than what we originally had in mind of of you know, of undertaking so we are always in control always what god does what this high order spirits do for us is encouragement they give us encouragement they give us strength when we ask when we ask, Divaldo has a very interesting thing about this. He said at one point he was under, under a lot of pain because of his, uh, his back. And that uh, one day he um, addressed Joanna de Angelis and, uh, and asked her you know, in a, a very nice way, but to see if it, she could do something for, uh, about that. And I'm just going to give you the, the first part of the answer that Joanna uh, gave to him. Uh, she said, well, uh, we did not help you before because you never asked us. You never prayed and said explicitly, please help me with this pain. You ask for other things, you ask for assistance at the Mansão do Caminho, you ask for assistance for a lecture and this, but you never specifically asked us for assistance with respect to your pro personal health problem. So we did not interfere. Spirits are here to assist us. They are doing God's will, which is to allow us the best conditions possible to progress in this life. But we have to ask. And when we want to change, we can change. We can change the things that are on the moral side. Okay? Be careful when I say we can change. We have to be very careful not to think that, oh, so then um, if I, uh, I decide now at uh, over 50 to become uh, uh, an MBA uh, player, uh, well, that's not what we're talking about. We are talking about the moral side of things. Okay, not talk about physical things. The body that we have is the body we put together in the spiritual realm. That body, there is a certain determinism about that body, not fatalism. Determinism about that body. The only thing about fatalism about the body is actually death. The physical body will die. So the physical body, there's a determinism about it. I cannot decide to have a third arm, for instance, or two heads to think better. But on the moral side, we can change whenever we want, as long as we will it, as long as we want it.
Okay. Because I, I don't know about the time. Oh. Yeah, 847. Yeah, we have to okay. stop here. Oh, we don't want to, to start the next one anyway. Okay. Um, so Orlando was trying to say hi, was trying to say something, but apparently he's uh, still having trouble with this a microphone. Um, we, we hear you, Orlando. Hi. <laughs> we cannot hear you, unfortunately, but uh, we're here. We can see you. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Um, well, maybe he can write the, the question and we can address it before our next, our next meeting, before we start our next meeting. Yeah. So um, who volunteers to do our final prayer? Raise your hand. One, two, three. Teresa, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Yes, thank you. Um, let us all um, relax, let our minds relax at this point. And we thank Julio for the beautiful study and all the mentors who supported and guided this study, the mentors of SGNY and our own individual mentors of our homes, our guardian angels. Let us take into our week the lessons that we learned here, the importance of our free will and the true meaning of fatalism and understanding God's mercy in our forgetfulness and in determining our future. Let us take forward with us the golden rule, do unto others as we would like done to us. And God willing, let us return next week together. As we get ready to close, let us thank our Master Jesus and Mother Mary for their guidance and protection in the crisis that we are facing on earth today. And knowing that this too shall pass, trust. And remember the importance of being other-centered at this time, remembering to serve instead of being served. In humility and respect, we ask permission to close our study. So be it.